Hello, welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, what does the future hold for China-Japan relations? And the push for plant-based foods in China. Well, when you mention you're a vegan, the first thing people ask would be like, what, what do you mean? Like, uh, they generally don't have a very good understanding of, of what veganism is. But first, what's making news on the platforms the people themselves use, Weibo and WeChat? Joining me is Yvonne Yong. Yvonne, Chinese holidaymakers have found themselves trapped as COVID lockdowns continue in parts of the country. Hi, Stan. Yes, this time it's the island of Hainan, known as China's Hawaii. The holiday vibes took a hit earlier this month when 1,200 people in the resort hub of Sanya got COVID. Well, now some 80,000 domestic tourists have found themselves locked down in paradise. Many had just escaped strict COVID measures in cities like Shanghai. One Weibo user begged to be allowed to go home, while another said they felt helpless while trapped in Sanya. Authorities have announced lockdowns will continue across many parts of the island and while an excuse to stay on the beach could have been a silver lining, tourists learned they would still be expected to pay 50% of the room rate at their resorts while trapped. One frustrated traveller posted this video on Weibo. And for those who want out, visitors need to stay on the island for a full week and show proof of five negative COVID tests before being allowed to depart. There have been other examples of China's strict COVID measures being posted online this week. This video shows people on a bus in a high-risk zone being refused permission to exit to go to the bathroom. Instead, the bewildered passengers were given a bucket. And in Shanghai, people in the Oriental Fisherman's Wharf building fled after reports someone inside returned a positive COVID result, which would have meant a local 48-hour lockdown. Citizens were divided over the crowd's reaction, with one saying it looked like the new season of Squid Game, and another pointing out that people aren't afraid of getting sick, but rather getting stuck in isolation. And China has finished its military drills around Taiwan. Yes, the exercises came to an end on Wednesday, but the People's Liberation Army says it will carry out regular patrols and continue preparations for war. Overnight, a delegation of US lawmakers arrived in Taiwan for a two-day visit, during which they'll meet President Tsai Ing-wen just 12 days after Nancy Pelosi's trip. Such visits aren't uncommon. Six US lawmakers visited the island in April. Many Chinese netizens expressed disappointment that military drills have concluded. Can we extend the exercises? Keep going. Taiwan won't last long. Don't stop. Let the world see our determination. Up to five ballistic missiles are thought to have landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone while the military drills were taking place, leading to a rise in tensions just a month out from a significant anniversary. This year marks 50 years of diplomatic relations between China and Japan. The joint statement, signed in 1972, was supposed to end post-war confrontation between the two countries and open a new chapter of peace, friendship and cooperation. But as the date approaches, the mood is far from festive, with this tension over Taiwan and long-simmering territorial disputes bringing historic grievances out into the open. Mr. Shinzo Abe died at 5.03 p.m. China's official response to Shinzo Abe's assassination was sympathetic, with President Xi expressing his deep regret. But on Chinese social media, anti-Japanese sentiment was rife. Hashtag Abe has no vital signs went viral, and many expressed glee that Japan's former prime minister was dead. The public response reflects decades of Chinese government propaganda, vilifying the Japanese for wartime atrocities. There is a very strong feeling among a lot of people in China that Japan is the enemy, that Japan has been very, very nasty to China. Japan and China's dark history of conflict 
dates back centuries. But it's a more recent war that remains a source of tension today. The Japanese started a series of very aggressive incidents from the beginning of the 1930s and started a general war in China from 1937 until Japan was defeated in 1935. The war left an estimated 15 to 20 million Chinese dead and included one of the worst atrocities of modern times, the Nanjing massacres. The Japanese invading army marched into Nanjing and claiming that male Chinese of military age were soldiers. And therefore, they basically started a massacre. Thousands of women and girls were forced into sexual slavery for Japanese soldiers, so-called comfort women, an issue that's still unresolved today. A better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. Japan finally surrendered after the US bombed the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, bringing an end to World War II and the forced dismantling of Japan's military. Japan has tried very hard to make amends, and the previous government in China under Chiang Kai-shek make a point that China will forgive, though not forget, about Japanese aggression with a view to develop friendship between China and Japan. China agreed to waive reparations, and economic cooperation between the two countries increased. China would become, for more than a decade or two, its largest single recipient of Japanese development aid something which the Chinese government has absolutely refused to publicly acknowledge. Despite Japan's repeated apologies for its wartime conduct, some Japanese leaders continue to deny the past. Visits to the Yasukuni Shrine by Japanese Prime Ministers angers China. The shrine honors the war dead, including convicted Japanese war criminals. And long-simmering tensions are increasing over a territorial dispute in the East China Sea, the Japanese-controlled Senkaku Islands, which China claims and calls Diaoyu. You have, on the one hand, a China that is uh, aggressively projecting its power, and on the other hand, a Japan very concerned about that power. And that just does not make for an easy relationship between the two. In recent years, Japan has tried to build closer ties with China, but has also sought to overturn Japan's pacifist constitution, increase military spending, and voiced support for Taiwan. Japan became a, an extraordinary country uh, after the Second World War in accepting Article 9 of the Constitution, the so-called Peace Clause. So for Japan to even consider moving away from Article 9 is an enormous deal politically, mainly because of the concern that Japan now has over the threat that potentially comes from China. For President Xi, nationalism, stoked by anti-Japanese sentiment, is a powerful tool and perhaps a welcome distraction from China's domestic woes of repeated COVID lockdowns and a weakening economy. Yamagami Shingo is the Japanese ambassador to Australia and I spoke to him earlier from Canberra. Ambassador, thank you so much for giving us your time. There has been a, a notable shift, hasn't there, in Japan's posture towards China when it comes to issues like Taiwan, increased pressure on China. Why are we seeing that? In light of uh, what has been transpiring in Ukraine, I think people, you know, including Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, have a sense of crisis that Ukraine today should never become East Asia tomorrow. So in that regard, you know, we are increasingly concerned about the security situation in East Asia. How come ballistic 
missiles have to be launched across Taiwan into Japanese exclusive economic zones in response to U.S. politicians' visit to Taipei. This is something beyond comprehension by ordinary Japanese. The tension has always existed around Taiwan, hasn't it? The Chinese Communist Party has always reserved the right to use force. But we are seeing this shift right now. We're seeing Japan being more forceful, increasing its tone. Why are we seeing that? Is this because, in your mind, the clock is ticking? I think uh, you know, the situation taking place you know, around Taiwan is not alien to many Japanese because we have witnessed this, you know, such behavior uh, in the recent past around you know, Japanese islands of Senkaku. Those islands are incorporated in Japan 1895. Uh, for more than 76 years, there was no claim made by Beijing. But all of a sudden, you know, in 1970s, they started their claim, and not only that, they kept on sending their patrol of vessels into territorial waters around Japanese islands of Senkaku. So this kind of you know, behavior, or I should say attempt to challenge the status quo by force or you know, threat of force, has been going on for several decades. What does that mean for Japan's military posture? Because we know since World War II, Japan has had what is known as a, a pacifist constitution. Are we likely to see a shift in that, an end to that, an increased militarization from Japan? I don't think militarization is the uh, you know, right way to put it. Uh, we are trying our best to respond to the increasingly you know, severe, you know, deteriorating you know, security situation surrounding Japan. Talking about the relationship between you know, Japan and China, of course, you know, we have tremendous amount of differences in terms of you know, basic values, democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, a market economy. Also, we have difference in strategic interests as well. But that said, there is also a history of cooperation, especially since 1972, when Japan normalized our diplomatic relationship with China. So what we are doing right now is to call on our colleagues in Beijing to abide by international laws and norms so that we can live in peace. They become a responsible member of the rules-based international community. But Ambassador, can Japan meet what you've identified as an increased threat from China if you don't change that pacifist constitution? I think, uh, you know, uh, everybody, you know, or every student of, you know, diplomacy and international relations would agree that diplomacy and deterrence are two wheels of one cart. Yes, we are, you know, addressing, you know, uh, challenges, and in order to do that, while we are engaging in quiet diplomacy, at the same time, we need a reliable you know, deterrence so that any contingency will not take place surrounding Japan. So yes, it is true, we need to strengthen our defense posture. You know, we have to improve our defense capabilities. But that said, you know, we'd like to keep open the channel of communication anytime. So just to be clear, does that mean that a change to what is known as Article 9 is on the table. It's up to you know, Japanese you know, public to decide whether we need you know, constitutional change or not. I think according to the recent opinion poll, uh, the number of Japanese you know, supporting uh, you know, discussions on the amendment of constitution are on steady you know, increase. There has been a lot of speculation about what would happen in the event of a conflict over Taiwan, whether the United States would join in the defence of Taiwan. What would that mean for Japan? Would Japanese troops be fighting alongside American troops? Let me tell you that uh, you know, situation you know, across the Taiwan Strait uh, could pose a grave concern to the security of Japan and the safety of Japanese people. For example, you know, these waters where Chinese ballistic missiles landed, you know, Japanese side of the median line between 
island of Taiwan and small islands off the coast of Okinawa. It is one of the busiest maritime routes. So this is not an issue you know, only for Japan. This is an issue for the region and the entire global community. Ambassador, we know that there has been a long-standing tension between Japan and China, and we know that that emerges out of the legacy of history and Japanese occupation. But that has been a long time since then. Why do we still see this resentment lingering? I think, uh, you know, an uh, important thing to remember is, you know, what is at issue is not uh, the events which took place, you know, 80 years ago. What is at issue is, you know, challenges, you know, we are facing uh, today. So, yes, you know, we have to learn lessons from history and post-war trajectory of Japan speaks for itself. I think there have been a lot of efforts, you know, made by, you know, people, including former Prime Minister, you know, Abe, in trying to improve our relationship uh, with China. This economic growth of China is a result of our joint cooperation. And we would like to go back to those days when we respect, you know, each other. So how to see China becoming a responsible, you know, rules abiding member of the international community. For that objective, there is a lot Australia and Japan can do together. It comes down to this though, Ambassador, doesn't it? When the biggest economy in the world, as China could soon be, is an authoritarian regime, then the world order, the global order shifts, doesn't it? I think we are seeing the challenges by authoritarian regimes, you know, uh, both in you know, Ukraine and in you know, Northeast Asia, and you know, countries like Australia, Japan, who know the importance of you know, basic universal values, such as democracy, respect for human rights, the rule of law. I think you know, this is a time for us to redouble our efforts, we know it, you know, from history, you know, if we join forces together, we can achieve a lot. Ambassador Yamagami, again, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you, Stan, for having me. Now the latest news out of China. If on last week marked two years since Australian journalist Cheng Lei was detained in China, accused of supplying state secrets overseas. Yes, Foreign Minister Penny Wong has vowed to continue to provide support to Ms Cheng. In a statement, she called on China to ensure basic standards of justice, procedural fairness and humane treatment. In a wide-ranging speech at the National Press Club last week, China's ambassador to Australia, Xiao Chen, was asked about Ms Cheng's situation. Mr Xiao wouldn't be drawn on Ms Cheng's case specifically, but said she was being treated fairly. There are a couple of Australian citizens uh, in China. They are under custody uh, according to Chinese uh, rules and laws. And um, uh, their basic rights are well protected. Don't worry about that. Australia's ambassador to China, Graeme Fletcher, was barred from attending Ms Cheng's trial in March, the outcome of which remains unknown. It was recently announced Mr Fletcher would stay on another 12 months as ambassador to China at the end of his three-year term. He has consistently criticised the lack of transparency around Ms Cheng's case and asked she be allowed to see her two children. Ms Cheng hasn't seen them since her arrest two years ago. Stan. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Stan. China is the biggest consumer of meat in the world and with the goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and become carbon neutral by 2060, cutting back on meat consumption is critical to achieving this goal. 4% of China's population is estimated to be vegetarian, but the number of people going plant-based or flexitarian is growing. Annie Louie has the story. Pan-fried dumplings, sweet and sour pork, and even deep-fried goose. They're all iconic Chinese dishes, but these are a bit different to what you might be used to. Some people will say, we're vegetarian, we're vegan, you know? But this is chicken, I say, no, 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 that's not the root, it's mock meat, you know? 
Tiffy T and her family have put a unique twist on some favourite Chinese dishes. Gong Di Lin is one of the only Chinese restaurants in Melbourne dedicated to vegan and veggie cuisine. Because my mum is Buddhism, myself as well, and then with and my dad is very experienced of um, cooking vegetarian, vegan stuff. In China, being vegetarian is still mostly associated with being Buddhist. For instance, my family of meat eaters would go vego on religious holidays and eat foods like this fake duck from a can. Mm. I think you're supposed to cook it first. The mock meat is actually very easy for people that just started to become vegetarian or vegan so they can find a little bit of that kind of, you know, um, transition. But like much of the world, it's young people in China that are leading the charge towards vegan and vegetarian diets. China is now one of the fastest growing markets in the world for plant-based meat with sales increasing by up to 25% annually. Mm. High-profile celebrities like actress Zhang Zheng Chu have endorsed the trend too, speaking out against the ethical, environmental and health problems associated with rising meat consumption. China has always had a bad rep for being super non-vegetarian friendly. Evelyn is a vegetarian and YouTuber currently living in Guangzhou. She says while it's becoming more popular to be vegetarian in China, there are some unique challenges. In China, I would say uh, like eating meat is still the predominant culture. Some commentators have even said the trend is blind worship of Western values and views. Well, when you mention you're a vegan, the first thing people ask would be like, what, what do you mean? Like, uh, they generally don't have a very good understanding of, of what veganism is. Also, because in China, there was a, a period of famine where uh, meat was really, like, scarce. Um, and so it was also seen as a kind of a, a symbol of, of uh, kind of material well-being. And for many, that association between meat and affluence might be hard to budge. In the 1960s, when scarcity was rampant, the average person in China ate less than 5 kilograms of meat every year. But consumption soared as the country developed. Now China consumes half of all the world's pork, and the average Chinese person eats around 50 kilograms of meat a year. But one way some Chinese entrepreneurs are hoping to buck this trend is by creating culturally relevant plant-based products. We want our plant-based meat uh, to look and taste like real meat. Vince Liu is the CEO and founder of Gen Meat. He says they were the first plant-based meat startup in China, and there are a few key challenges to overcome to convince people to eat his products. If you think about, you know, Chinese consumer may be more realistic than Western consumers, right? And if we, if we talk about food in China, we have to talk about price, which is the first, and the tasty, that is second, and also convenience, that is third. So we cannot escape that triangle. David Jung agrees. He's the co-founder of another meat alternative brand, Hong Kong-based Omnifoods. I founded the Green Monday Group um, to advocate a plant-based diet and really try to build a movement for everyone. If we ask people to just you know, give up meats and go for salad or tofu, for example, um, sadly, that's not going to work because um, you know, the, the change is going to be too dramatic for most people. You know, meats and seafood is associated to affluence uh, and kind of wealth uh, in general. So uh, to shift that mindset will take some time. China's government also appears to be warming up to the idea of the industry's potential. Earlier this year, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs included cultivated meats and other future foods in its roadmap for food security. Reducing meat production and consumption is also seen as crucial for China to meet its ambitious plan to be carbon neutral by 2060. But there's still plenty of people out there that will need convincing to change their diets. My simple advice is, you know, kind of choose whatever day or whatever meal that, um, you know, people feel most comfortable to them um, and use that as a starting point. Good one, David. I'm going to take it one meal at a time.
starting right now. And Andy Louie joins me now. How's it going on this meat-free journey? It's going pretty well. I have been <laughs> able to substitute some things. Um, I'm still really fascinated by the fake meat part of the diet, so mm. it's going to take a while for me to probably leave that. <laughs> but have you tried some alternatives yourself? Steve? I have. When we lived in Beijing, it was interesting. A lot of your guests there were talking about being Buddhist, and my wife is, and there was a Buddhist restaurant near us, Pure Lotus. It was a vegetarian restaurant right near our home. And we went there all the time. And, and the meat substitution, it does taste like meat. Yeah, it's so different to here in Australia where the vegans and vegetarians don't want things to taste like meat, so it will take a bit of time to transition mm. away from that. Now, food, of course, is really important um, in China, and people would measure their day by when the next meal is. It, but, of course, the memory of famine for older people is, is something that's still very real, isn't it? Yeah, I discussed this with my mum and I actually found out her uncle was a butcher, so they'd get some meat there. They'd also have some animals on their farm, so pigs, cows and chickens. And so they'd have it on rare occasions and they'd have it sparingly. But Chinese people have a really good reputation for eating everything of an animal. So they would also use the lard uh, to use for cooking because oil was rationed during then. Well, certainly you go to those markets in China and nothing's hidden at all. There's certainly no secret to the process. Annie, thank you again. Thanks, Dan. Anyone who's walked through the streets in China may have heard the distinct clink of tiles being shuffled around a table, often accompanied with laughter. It's the sound of mahjong, a tile-based game that's similar to the card game Rummy. China tonight met up with a group of players to find out why it's so popular and why it was once banned in China. <笑>一開始那些人很開心的時候就會很高興啊 <笑>因為我們因為不是很懂得 <笑>一打人就知道了 
咁樣用手搓噶嘛，樣樣可以促進我哋嗰個誒活動。快啲期望嗰日會打麻雀，即係咁啊！因為咁樣咧，大家可以有一齊去，有得玩，有嘢得開心。And that's all we have on this week's show. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.